Okay, welcome to video seven of this series, Understanding Negative Interest Rates. Here we are in the middle of March, and in a few days, the Federal Reserve is going to be giving guidance about what they're going to be doing with interest rates. And when we started this series, I thought that we would actually see negative interest rates here in the United States because things were not looking good coming out of the absolute market meltdown in the month of January 2016. But things have changed around. Clearly, Japan is operating in negative interest rates, and just last week, Europe went to negative interest rates as well. But that's not the case here in the United States, and that is the point of this video, is to talk about market corrections. And I want to start off with this question, the premise of why. Why does 2008 still linger in everybody's mind? My argument is that we never came out of the recession, that all of the quantitative easing and the zero interest rates by the Fed never pulled us out of this recession. Why? Because this recession caused deflation. There was deflation and has been deflation in our system. And this quantitative easing, all this money that the Federal Reserve has been printing. So just think about it this way. Think about this black hole, this bucket. And this black bucket is called deflation. And you're pouring all the stimulus inside the bucket and it just disappears. What you're hoping is as these dollars go in, it fills the bucket up, right? And then it starts overflowing and that overflow is growth. And in the vernacular of the Fed, that growth is inflation. But guess what happened? It didn't happen that way. We have this, we have this bucket that all this money is being poured into and there's a hole in the bottom and it just keeps coming out the other end and the bucket never fills up. Now, we do have a history here of this, this combination of what happened in 2008 and deflation, which was the whole 1929. That's why I went back in history on some of these videos to educate you on what really went on. And one of the things we have to understand is, and what we have to understand is the stock market actually went up from this 1929 to 1939 period of time, even though technically this was the Great Depression. So looking at a chart, you can see the big correction, but then you can see from 1933 through 37, the market actually did go up, but it came right back down and we moved sideways for a four year period of time. And then we slowly started to crawl out. Why? Because of the growth that the World War II manufacturing machine provided for us. What's fascinating is when you look at the quantitative easing program, who instituted that? Well, it was Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve Chairman who, sta who stood at the microphone with Hank Paulson and Timothy Geithner after the meltdown saying, we've got to save the, the economy by pumping a bunch of stimulus into the system. This is Dr. Ben Bernanke to you and me. And how did Bernanke get his PhD? What did he write his thesis on? The Great Depression. So the important perspective through this entire series is we have to understand something. The Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is what? Ultimately, what is it? It is a bank. And how does a bank make money? They make money through loans and collecting interest. Now look, if I'm a broccoli farmer, I want to convince you that broccoli is good for you and you need to buy a lot of broccoli. If I'm a manufacturer of fluoride, I want to make sure the government is convincing everybody that we need to have fluoride in our water. And if I'm a bank, I want to do what? I want to convince you that debt is a good thing. And if you're the Federal Reserve, this isn't something you can convince somebody. This is something you can mandate. How do they mandate? Well, I want to circle back to this movie, The Big Short, where I told you that uh, you should go see the movie. And we used it uh, in an illustration in one of our early videos. And my frustration with the Hollywood version of The Big Short, you do not get this in the book. If you read the book, you do not get this impression I'm about to talk about. But the Hollywood version is that the Wall Street banks are mean, no good, 
they they did all this bad stuff and and that's really what caused the problem now clearly the wall street banks had a part in this but the genesis of the pain came from where the genesis of the pain came from the government because what the government did and we know this factually is they sat down with the different banks and said you will you will underwrite these subprime loans meaning you will underwrite mortgages to people who fundamentally can't afford them by simply not asking what their income is and so forth. So the government wanted to extend this debt. They wanted to extend it into a broader area of people's lives. That's why when you look at these themes that I have running through these videos, debt overhang is the big one, right? Debt overhang is the reason we can't grow out of this problem because the government, the Federal Reserve, has supply. What's their supply? Their supply is money. Their supply is debt. So what are they interested in? Just like the broccoli farmer or the fluoride manufacturer, what are they interested in? They are interested in guaranteeing that there is demand for their supply. Well, this is one way of creating that demand is opening up the subprime mortgage area. What's another area that's flying below the radar? I actually wrote about this several times last year. How about this one? Student loan debt. Do you want to take a wild guess of what student loans are up to? There's actually, you can go to the internet and you can look it up. There's a student loan clock. $1.3 trillion and counting. I actually started talking about this student loan crisis, which I believe is what it is, last year in position papers. And then in the January alert, I talked about this concept of helicopter money that you're going to hear more and more about. And you still hear Hillary Clinton talking about this student loan forgiveness and how we're going to accomplish that, which again speaks back to this debt overhang issue and you know this hocus pocus accounting measure of forgiving student loan debt it's just moving money around on the ledger and ultimately the taxpayers, you and me, have to pay for all this. Okay, sorry, I'm realizing this video is getting very long. So I'm going to stop this here and we'll pick up with part two on our next release. Okay, thanks for watching.